Heine Grace has just read to you one of the most famous passages of Scripture, a passage from the prophet Ezekiel, in which in a very dramatic fashion, he depicts dry bones from a defeated army coming back together and coming back to life. I don't know exactly what happened. I expect nobody does. But we do know that the mighty Babylonian army for two and a half years laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And finally, the city surrendered and the Babylonians totally destroyed it. Everything. They destroyed the walls, knocking the walls down. They burned everything that would burn. All the houses were gone. The temple was demolished and Solomon's wealth, all his gold, was, was dispersed and lost. Everything was gone and the people who remained alive were transported, many of them, transported to Babylon itself, hauled across the country as exiles and servants. And so, in this particular moment, the Judeans at the very end sent out their little National Guard army, as if that army, small as it was, could stand against 100,000 Babylonian well-trained troops. Well, they couldn't, and they were totally defeated. There was nobody left even to bury the dead, and so their bones were left in the valley for the wild animals and the carrion birds to pick clean. And Ezekiel, who was carried off to Babylon and was there as a captive in exile with the rest of the Judeans, he was speaking to those Judeans who felt as if they had lost everything. No city, no temple, no homes, no economic activity, nothing, no religious activity, all destroyed, totally demolished. And everywhere they had looked before they departed, there was destruction and ruin. No wonder they felt as if they had no future. No wonder they felt so desolate. And it was to these people that Ezekiel spoke the word of the God, of God. And he sang a little spiritual to them. And you know the words, the toe bones connected to the foot bone. And the foot bones connected to the leg bone. The leg bones connected to the thigh bone. The thigh bones connected to the hip bone. The hip bones connected to the back bone. And the back bones connected to the shoulder bone. And the shoulder bones connected to the neck bone. And the neck bones connected to the head bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Them bones, them bones gonna walk around. Them bones, them bones gonna rise again. Them bones, them bones gonna live again. Now hear the word of the Lord. And Ezekiel told them a story of their future, that they would return, that they would rebuild, that all was not lost, that God still had plans for them. Dem bones, dem bones, gonna rise again. What a wonderful story. You wonder if anybody believed him. There they were. The reality they were facing was one of exile when all seemed to be lost. The people of Israel seemed to be over. 
Well, we obviously know that that was not the case. They did return 70 years later. The great-grandchildren of the exiles returned, and slowly but surely, with much trouble, they rebuilt their walls, they rebuilt their homes, they rebuilt their city, and they rebuilt the temple, the center of their religion. Them bones, them bones, going to walk around. They were not totally defeated. We live in a time when there are numerous Americans who are unhappy with the, with the direction this country is going. What's happening in this nation is that the diversity that's been here all along has become more prominent, larger in number and larger in scope. And it frightens some people who are afraid, like the exiles of old, that they've lost something. They've probably lost what they perceived to be whatever power they had before. This nation is a very diverse nation. There are black people and white people and Hispanic people and Asian people and Native American people. That's just to mention a few. There are people in this country from every other country in the world. And there are straight people and gay people and trans people and non-binary people. And there are people who have different political points of view. There are some who are pro-choice and some who are pro-life. There are people who have different kind of uh, conservative ideas and different kinds of liberal ideas. And there are Republicans and there are Democrats and there are moderates and there are liberals and there are gun enthusiasts and there are gun what would you say, advocates. There are climate de defenders and there are fossil fuel defenders. There are all kinds of religious people, Christian people, Jewish people, Muslim people, and nearly every other religion in the world is in this country and the diversity frightens many. The diversity is a scary thing, and yet the diversity is a wonderful thing. Our president says it's our greatest strength. And some people look upon diversity as frightening, but others look upon diversity and say, welcome to the United Church of Hyde Park. We are the diversity we proclaim it's even in the vision statement that we have. We believe in diversity. <laughs> we think it's a good thing. The differences are challenging and life-giving and fulfilling in so many ways. And in a polarized nation, we find that the best thing we can do, the most powerful action we can take, is to be a part of this church. This church is a living example of the future that we want and the future that we're receiving. And so we find ourselves today in the state of Illinois, which is quite open, in contrast to the state of Florida, which is trying to get rid of all the diversity in the nation. And we're not afraid of it. We welcome the diversity we find, just like Ezekiel of old. We find ourselves in a different place 
than this nation has ever been before, but we think it's a good thing and we welcome it. I was appointed years ago when I was serving as a, a parish minister in the Iowa Conference of the United Methodist Church. I was appointed to the first United Methodist Church in Carroll, Iowa. I shared this story with our council a week ago, but it's a success story of a church that was dying they, it was in such bad shape, the church in Carroll, that they called the bishop all the way from Des Moines to come and stand on their dirt floor with the rest of them in a building that was falling down and a congregation that was getting smaller week by week until it was nearly ready to fold up. And they asked the bishop, can you help us? And the bishop said, I don't think so. I think you're beyond help and it's probably time for us to close this church. And then he got back in his car and drove back to Des Moines. Well, he left the official board standing there on the dirt floor looking at each other and saying to each other, we are not going to close our church. They looked in their billfolds and they found some money. All together, they found some money. And so they did some wonderful things. First of all, they raised money. Secondly, they tore down the old church building. Thirdly, they tore down the parsonage and they sold the land. And then they moved to the western suburbs where most of the housing was going up and where people were living and they built a brand new building, a beautiful new church building and a big parsonage until they were noticed by everybody in town and more people started to come to that church until pretty soon, instead of a dying church, they had a growing church. By the time I was appointed there, all this had been done and I inherited the work of other people and a congregation with more than 600 members. It was big, and the church was filled every Sunday. A wonderful, a wonderful appointment. Well, back in the distance, as I stood in that pulpit, I'm sure I heard a voice saying, them bones, them bones, gonna rise again because I was in the midst of them and they were <laughs> walking around. A wonderful story of what a church can do when it has great problems that it's facing. There was a pastor who, looking out at his congregation in a city, said, I try to imagine the multitude of dry bones rattling to find one another. The bones of those who have gone before us. The young urban man whose family is a gang. The single mom with two jobs and two kids and two $20 bills left at the end of the month. The middle-aged man riddled with Parkinson's, the elderly woman with Alzheimer's, the young woman who cuts herself in order to feel the pain in her life. The lonely, the aged, the unemployed, the sick, the despairing, the addicted, the bones of the dried up, those who want to be put back together. There are some people who live in the valley of dry bones, and you know what I'm talking about. You know what that feels like to live in that valley. It's like the valley of the shadow of death, and you wonder is there any life 
possible. Can the Holy Spirit enter the hearts of those who I see each week? Can the Holy Spirit enter this church and bring life where life has been missing? Well, when you find yourself in the valley of dry bones, when all you see is death and dryness and defeat. I invite you this morning, those who put together our lectionary and chose this text for today, invite you also to listen very carefully. Listen. And I think off in the distance, you will hear a voice saying, Dem Boons, Dem Boons, going to rise again. Dem Boons, Dem Boons, going to walk around. Dem Boons, Dem Boons, going to live again. Now hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen.